Due to adult content, parental discretion is advised. To begin. Are you watching closely? To begin. I just, I'm bored. Gonna start. What plaything can you offer me today? Here's the deal. Just give me the facts. Just the facts. Only the facts. Breathe. Focus. Keep it simple. No, 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 no doubt, no doubt. Okay, welcome to Cock and Vol Minute, a Tristram Shandy story. A podcast in which, eventually, ostensibly, at some point, we will be talking about the 2005 film Tristram Shandy, a cock and bull story, one minute at a time. Good lord, what is this story all about? Cock and a bull story. Here's your host, me, Robert Black. And we're back. We're still on group four. Brigsby Bear versus Dave Made a Maze, uh, here with guest Sean German of Groundhog Minute, Spinal Tap Minute, Next Scene Podcast, National Lampoon's uh, Christmas National Vacation Lampoon's Day. Christmas Vacation Days, and so many great guest spots on other podcasts. And who is the reason I'm a podcaster as well? That should be said. If, I think we mentioned that before. When you were on, I don't here. know if I should um, apologize. You don't want to take credit for that. <laughs> uh, well, and, and I should say that you're responsible for me seeing uh, both these films. Oh, nice. Dave made a maze I had not heard of till you announced you were doing your community project of, of having guest hosts cover it minute by minute. Right. Brigsby Bear I had heard of and kind of sounded like, oh, this sounds like something I would like, but for some reason had never gotten around to actually seeing it till, till I think it was you – you writing about it in uh, your blog, the Groundhog Day Project. Yeah, there was there was a week at the end of the year. What year did these come out? These are both in 2017. 2017. So the that December, basically, that I ended the year of the blog by watching these two movies over and over again mm-hmm. and kind of like putting the year in perspective kind of thing, talking about these two movies because uh, they were two of my favorite movies that year. Because they both make, they both of them make me feel good. Mm-hmm. Like some movies I like despite the fact like they make me angry or they make me like hate humanity because people are awful people. And these two, these two movies are about people coming together. And as you said last time in the case of Brigsby, it's really overt and obvious because it's a film crew. You have to do that as a group, generally speaking. Someone has to hold the camera. Someone has to be in front of the camera. Someone has to be holding the mic or doing the special effects or whatever else they have to do. And they have lots of characters to play. Whereas with Dave, a lot of the creation of the maze was singular. It was him on his own for a weekend building this thing that got out of control. But as, as I mentioned at the very end last time is at the end of Dave made a maze, they need more people. They have to do a split up thing. The thing that they don't get on camera because they lose that tape is they need the one, the film crew to distract cardboard Bryn, which is the Minotaur controlling her so that they can sneak into the middle of the maze and create a weak spot and so it comes down to this weird divided group effort to get things done but ultimately for me the way i think of the movies is both of them are about how a bunch of people have to get together to accomplish something which is this really wholesome kind of cheesy thing but it also works in both of these cases it doesn't come across as silly where some movies with similar theme it could come across really silly. It's like, oh, we have to work together to do things. I'm like, oh, shut up. <laughs> but these work. And I think it's because they both start from, they start with characters, but both of the main characters, James and Dave, essentially start as being like in pain. James doesn't realize it. He doesn't know until a few minutes in mm-hmm. that he's been kidnapped. He's just been growing up in this bunker. And Dave is kind of, backed himself into a weird corner where he keeps trying creative projects that fail. But they both start in this bad place and it gets better with the help of other people. And it's it's a nice message done well. Yeah. And I think part of that is it doesn't feel forced or fake in terms of these are two people that are creating something because they they wanted to. Yeah. And it's just that simple. I mean, Dave comes out and says it like I, I created, I built this maze because I wanted to build something. I built the maze because I wanted to make something. I think that's almost a direct quote. Yeah. Um, what he literally says. I built something because I wanted to build something. And if I could just finish it, I just know that it would, it would be great. And yeah, you know, James, it's, it's a form of therapy, as we talked about, of him working through mm-hmm. his, 
experience and, and trauma through this film, but that's, that's not his thought. His thought process is here's this story and I want to finish it. Yeah. It doesn't have an ending. Um, yeah. And that's, that's better than the, the trope of the clubhouse is going to get repossessed or we lost our lease and we were going to put on a talent show to raise money to keep the theater or the community center open. And I mean, that's from, yeah. um, you know, Mickey Rudy and Judy Garland up until, you know, breaking. I think they had a breakdance <laughs> contest to raise money to save, <laughs> you know, cause the big, you know, the man, the developer wanted to come in and knock down the community center. So we're going to put on a breakdance show. Like, I mean, that trope spans all of entertainment, it seems. Whereas this is their, it's more realistic, I think, to say I, the creator creates for the act of creation. It's not for anyone or anything else other than. I wanted to build a thing, so I did it. I wanted to make, you know, yeah. I wanted to finish this, the story of Brigsby Bear and give it an ending. And he did it. And if it happened to, to help out, you know, it brings the community together, brings his family together. It helps him work through his issues. Yeah. But that's not, he's not, at least consciously, he's not doing that for those ends. Right. Just a quick tangent. Have you actually watched Breakin' since it came out? How, how do you remember the plot of Breakin'? <laughs> <laughs> it's straight. I probably, I have watched it since it came out, but it's, I mean, it, it, you know, the last time I saw it, I'm going to feel like it may be, a, it, it may be 20 years old the last time I saw it. And that may be 20 years ago is how, <laughs> but. Okay. And to be fair, to interrupt from editing, he's actually talking about the plot too. Break in two, Electric Boogaloo. Party people in the place to be! This is what you've all been waiting to see! Electric Boogaloo, the ultimate show! With Kelly, Ozone, and Turbo! Electric Boogaloo is break dance too! Yes, ooh! Hi! Electric Boogaloo's action stands the best you'll get! Like break dance when you ain't seen nothing yet. I'll finish you, your friends, and your whole damn neighborhood. This time there is an enemy, so they must unite. Because to say what you believe in, sometimes you must fight. You lost your edge. Fine. Electric Boogaloo's the greatest, nothing can compete. And once you've seen this movie, you'll believe in the beat. I, mean, I, I saw that movie in the theater, I think. Or maybe it might have been on video yeah. right when it came out from like rented from the warehouse back in the 80s, but. I do not remember the plot yeah. of it, if it even had yeah. a plot. You said that, and I'm like, is that what that about? <laughs> well, be, and because it is such a trope that we're going to, you know, like, the little rascals probably did it half a dozen times. This, we're going to put on a show yeah. to save the, well, and I think, wasn't that also the plot of the Ali G movie? To save the, the community center in East Staines or wherever Ali G's from? Oh, wow. Like, it's probably. I'm just saying it's a very. <laughs> It's a very common thing. I know, it's the, it's the plot of the Brady yeah. movie. Yeah, well, there must be some way out of this mess. Everybody think. Certainly our time will come. You better sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Listen, you kids. I think our time has come. What do you mean? Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. We might as well face it. Our folks are up against it and up against it good. Hey, I've got it. We can enter that search for the stars contest. First prize is exactly twenty thousand dollars. Listen, are you kids willing to stick together and pull yourselves out of a hole? You bet. Sure. I've got an idea. Our folks think we're babes in arms, huh? Well, oh, we'll show them whether we're babes in arms or not. I'm going to write a show for us and put it on right here in Seaport. Hey, that's a nifty idea, Marcia. Great idea, Marcia. Good idea, Marcia. Might be the most up-to-date thing these hicks around here have ever seen. Opening night, we'll have Max Gordon, Sam Harris, Lee Schubert down to give us the once-over. How about it, kids? Oh! We'll get every kid in this town on our side, and we'll start right now. What do you say? Am I invisible? Do I not have a voice? I had that idea two days ago. Stop being so selfish, Jan. Oh, come on, Jan. Oh, Jan. Jan. Come on, you guys. We've got a big day ahead of us. We better get some rest if we're going to be a fresh, young musical group. It was my idea. Mine. Uh, come here. Didn't anybody hear me? You see, Henry says, we do this here concert, and we raise that $20,000... We could tell that little weasel banker to, uh, but that, but it's a theme that neither of these Oops. movies have. No, uh, they're not trying to save a thing. They're not trying to save the community yeah. or something bigger. It's it's the opposite. Yeah, it's the community saving a person. Right. right. 
and I think that feels more real or more acceptable, at least to me. It was interesting because I was just thinking about it. The hockey movie they do the fake <laughs> scene of in Brigsby Bear might have a similar plot. You know, they have to get together this ragtag kids hockey team to, like, I don't know, fix the coach's alcoholism. No, that's Mighty Ducks. Oh, there's there's layers and layers here. It's just, we're just peeling back the onion. So where does the kids hockey movie Inside Brigsby Bear, where does that rank on your list of all-time <laughs> Um, or do we need to do, do we need to do a ranking of movies within movies? I, well, I would think we sh- that would be interesting. That would be really fun. I think Rochelle Rochelle probably wins though. <laughs> Rochelle Rochelle, huh? It's not in a movie, but in a television great. show. Yeah. Yeah. Rochelle. Yeah. A young girl's strange erratic journey from Milan to Minsk. I, I think the problem I have with the hockey movie is Brigsby Bear seems to be set in the present, mm-hmm. right? They have YouTube, they have cell phones and everything. That hockey movie is really dated and sexist in one scene. Yeah. It's like the the great hockey player pulls off her helmet. It's a girl. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's shocked. I'm like, what is this, 1985? Well, yeah, because even I don't think Mighty Ducks has that scene and certainly by mighty ducks too it's yeah the team is co-ed girls can play hockey it's not yeah it's not commented upon yeah little giants was like that i don't think it had a like a scene where they were shocked it was a girl but it's a big deal that the girl is good at what she does yeah but a ranking of fictional films would be interesting yeah (laughs) so we see there's there's two um, just going back to uh, my notes and, and drawing parallels between characters of the two films. Yeah. As you mentioned, Dave has a girlfriend that he's living with, Annie. Yes. Who is initially not down with the maze. No. She's lived with this guy. She knows Dave. She knows the piano lessons and the painting and the all the other yeah. arts, you know, he that he 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 wouldn't want them to be called this, but they're hobbies. They're not. Well, and notably, she's the one who bought him the keyboard. Yeah. So she actively supports it. And she's kind of getting to the end of of her support. Yeah. And then I I thought there was a bit of a parallel there with Greg, with James's father, who similarly is skeptical of Mm. this movie making effort as Annie is of the maze, but ultimately comes around. Yeah. And and helps with the the way Annie ultimately helps with completing slash destroying the maze, Greg not only accepts but gets on board and assists and helps with the with finishing the film. Yeah, he's the one who convinces the police to finally give them all the yeah. props so that they can do something. And in the end Annie actually builds part of the yeah. chrysalis. So I I can see so she helps. Um, and I've seen this as as someone who got involved with with a daily podcast that that ran 5 days a week yeah. and and how much time that can take and and seeing kind of the reaction of, you know, my live-in girlfriend slash wife and that you can, you know, the the creation, the creative process, and a creation can take can take someone away, can take up a lot of someone's time and resources, and it can emotional energy. And so it it can a partner, a parent, family member can feel threatened, mm-hmm. and that's maybe natural, not entirely unusual to see that this thing that's taking this person away from me. So we're not spending as much time together. We're not doing as much together. It's it's a threat. But then you see, well, this is, you know, this is part of who this person is. If, if, yeah. if Dave, you know, Dave without the maze is not, it's not the full Dave. If Annie wants, you know, she, it's sort of like, I guess a catch 22. The maze takes Dave away from Annie. Annie can't be with Dave with the maze, or so she thinks in the beginning. Yeah. But if she take, but without the maze, what she has isn't, isn't the full Dave. He needs the maze to, to continue on the path to realizing what he will become. So she can't be with him with the maze. She can't be with him without the maze is how it may be where she starts. And by the end, she's, I think she sees, well, no, this is the maze is part of Dave. I can't split them up. Yeah. In holding Dave too close, I will lose him. And I think that's the point that, that Greg gets to as well. That if I try to, cause he's got, yeah, he, he's reunited with his son who was, I don't know if we get exact time, but it must have been, what, 20 years that James has been gone, almost his entire life. He's grown up 
And so he's got a he's got a literal list. I think at one point he pulls out a piece of paper of things he wants to do with his son. Yeah, things to do. And his son is not necessarily interested in all those things. And it, it's it's a struggle. He's if he, yeah, James has to become who he is to become. And if Greg holds him too close, he will lose him. I guess it's that you know if you love something, if you love someone, let them let them free. Yeah. In letting James go and allowing him to do this and go on this journey to make this film, that allows Greg to, they ultimately become closer and allows him to keep him, yeah. Yeah, and in a way, it's not even set them free. It's set them free and then run along with them. Yes. In these two movies. Yeah, run along. It's like, let them do what they're going to do and do it with them or, you know, support. Yeah, yeah, do it with them. Because like James and Dave, all of us podcasters are clearly damaged individuals. <laughs> Who need this therapy and this creative process that we might have to destroy in the end? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, we, we, we release these things onto the world. Yeah. And maybe people are listening. We hope people are listening. Sometimes, I, I don't know. Sometimes maybe, I don't Maybe check. we hope they aren't, depending on how <laughs> we've said too much. But I mean, we don't destroy it, but no, but it, it occurred to me recently. Using, well, you know, this system cast that we're recording on right now, mm-hmm. that if my account went away, my podcast wouldn't exist. Like they wouldn't be out there for people to hear anymore unless they had already downloaded the tracks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's a really simple disconnect for it all to just go yeah. away. It's just out in the that's... cloud. And if the cloud evaporates. Yeah. Yeah. You have to come to me. I have them all in Dropbox, people. You just got to find me. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm, a I'm a hoarder. So I've got <laughs> everything I've ever recorded, my podcast, guest spots for my podcast. Oh, I've got all of that recorded, yeah. but it's like, it would go away from everyone else's access. Oh, for everyone else, it would go away. Yeah. Yeah. I would po I would repost everything. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it all disappeared. I just need to set up what it is, is. And I'm thinking about this because, you know, disease and apocalypse and all that is I need to just have someone who has all my Dropbox login information. So <laughs> if they want to keep my stuff alive, they <laughs> can. Mm-hmm. Well, I wonder. So I will be remembered for all my bad movie opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think this was a, a Black Mirror episode where they, someone had passed, someone had, had like the main character had lost a loved one. And they submitted like all their diaries and recordings and everything. And it's software. It mimics him. You give it someone's name. It goes back and reads through all the things they've ever said online, their Facebook updates, their tweets, anything public. I just gave it Ash's name. The system did the rest. They had a a simulation created, basically like an android, or but the personality, the AI, was built on everything, all the records they had of that person. And I often wonder if if someone tried to create one of, you know, one of us podcasters create, you know, an an AI based on our podcasts, what sort of personality that would be. I think they could do pretty well the more episodes we have, the more guest spots we've got. Yeah, well, you aren't you, are you? That's another difficult one, to be honest with you. You're just a few ripples of you. There's no history to you. You're just a performance of stuff that he performed without thinking, and it's not enough. Come on. I aim to please. Aim to jump. Just do it. Okay. If you're absolutely sure. See, Ash would have been scared. He wouldn't have just leapt off. He would have been crying. He would have been... Oh. Oh. Oh, God, no. Please, I don't want to do it. Please don't make me do it. No, that's not fair. No, I'm I'm frightened, darling. Please, I, I don't mean I don't want to die. God, I don't want to die. But it's not fair. Please, I'm frightened. I don't want to die. Don't. No! I don't know. Uh, it'd be interesting to see because, like, when they take like all the action movie scripts and they stick them in a, a like this online app that like creates a generic action movie. Mm-hmm. If you take everything I've said on a podcast and create a generic script, what would it be like? 
or like a generic. Uh, See, mine's different You're, yeah. than yours, though, because I do shows where I literally write them out word for word ahead of time. And so it, it's maybe more artificial. You do all of yours like this. Um, You're just talking, right? Yeah. I, I do some scripting, but mostly it's I just have bullet points of notes and I'm off the cuff. Although yeah. I think it would it, – it depends on how they build it because – like if they base it off of Spinal Tap Minute, yeah, I think it would be. It, <laughs> there wouldn't be much there. I don't. I'm kind of a. a fa- I facilitate. I had a co-host, and we also often had. I think every almost every episode had a guest, but we often had more than one guest. So there were a lot mm-hmm. of different voices, and also sort of my first group podcasting experience. Yeah. So I didn't speak out much. Versus the the person you get if you go to my later podcasts or you go to my guest spots. Yeah, where I'm like. Um, I don't have to edit this thing. <laughs> and if it's not good, it's it's going up on someone else's name. So Yeah, your your young Frankenstein monologue is probably the record for guest monologue, I would think. <laughs> Was it 11 minutes or something like that? Or just you talking? I think after they edited it down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Let's I, get the uncut version. Yeah. You want I, the German cut. I think I went like 13 and a half or 14 minutes before <laughs> um before they cut some of it out. But they allowed me to embarrass myself as much as I was willing to. They just gave me all the rope I was going to take. So, yeah. So, it's – it's yeah, we don't see – I mean, I guess we see in Dave Made a Maze, we see some of his past attempts at projects and creativeness. Yeah. And they kind of become involved in the maze. There's a part of the maze that's like a keyboard and there's origami and, and other things that kind of show up. But we don't see – we don't see what's what's next for Dave. Yeah. What's his next endeavor? We don't see the next film that James makes or, or Spencer makes. We don't see what comes after. No. We have to assume or even hope that they're yeah. going to do something else. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I, I was thinking about this um, the other day, that that's, that's kind of realistic. That, you know, the people we encounter in real life, unless we're talking about, I mean, if you have a child or someone you, you know, you're around when they're born where you're there at the beginning, but usually in life you meet people and it's new, you know, it's a start of a chapter in your life, right? but their story has been going on. Yeah. And then if you, if you grow apart, if there was someone that you were just went to school with or a colleague, then you, you change employers, you change jobs and they, they leave your story, but their story continues. And, and films are, are like that, where these characters had a life before we came in and they have a life that continues after. We're just, we're part of their world for this little slice. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's much of life. That's most of our interactions with other people. We just were there for a little bit and then we, we go our separate ways, you know, ships passing in the night. Yeah. Now, the important question. And maybe coming back to your essential one is, how do we decide if one of these is better than the other? For the record, last round, Brigsby Bear didn't have to beat anything. Mm -hmm. It was up against everything is illuminated, and I just kept both because I'm a cheater. Mm -hmm. But Dave Made a Maze did beat Annihilation, which I am doing a very detailed, in-depth show about, and I love. But I felt I didn't need to talk about it again. The round before, Brigsby did beat Cabin in the Woods, which your co-host from uh, Spinal Tap Tap did a Movies by Minutes about. And Dave didn't have to beat one that round because it was up against the fountain and I wasn't losing either of those. So in this round, if you had to pick one, would we, do we want to? Hmm. I don't know. I think because there's, you know, there's, there's many different things that you can measure a movie by. One is how do you feel as you're watching it? Yeah. And I think by that measure, that, would go for me would go with Dave made a maze. It's, it's wacky. It's creative. It's this, this world inside the maze. It's so creative and so different from, from things I've seen in other films. I enjoy watching it so much. Whereas Brigsby is very realistic. This is a real world, real world physics, you know, it works in this world. If you stub your toe, it'll hurt. Whereas who knows what's going to happen in this maze. So the feeling while I'm watching it, it's the maze. The feeling after it's over, the I mean, I, 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 I'll say I cried at the first time I watched Brigsby Bear at the end. Yeah. The ending is so, it's so feel good in the right way. Yeah. It's not, it feels like it's earned. 
Like these characters work their way towards their happy ending. And by that measure, so how do I feel immediately after I'm done? Yeah. Then I'd go with, with Brigsby. I, I think that might come back to what you, your essential question from the beginning is the end of Dave Made a Maze is like this bittersweet moment. So mm-hmm. it's hard to feel good at the end, feel as good at the end as you would at Brigsby Bear. Yeah. I realized watching the movies again this week, because I hadn't watched either one in a while, is that I get more emotionally involved with Brigsby Bear, but I feel... I don't know if this is a good description. Existentially involved with Dave Made a Minute, or Dave Made a Maze, sorry. <laughs> Dave Made a Minute being my podcast about it. Of course I was involved in that. Yeah. Uh, but like Dave feels more like me, mm-hmm. but I am more invested in James as a character because I mean, at any point in this process, he could completely fall apart. And it's like, it's not that I care more, but it, the movie plays more on an emotional level. Maybe it's the wackiness of the maze and like turning into puppets and all of the cleverness of the design in Dave that makes it feel different. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started doing the bracket, I'm like, I was having trouble comparing movies to each other because I'm like, it feels like if I pick a movie, I can never watch the other one ever again. I'm like, obviously that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But every time I had to choose, I'm like, I don't want to pick one of these over (laughs) the other one. Yeah. It's it's tough. I mean, then another measure of a movie is, you know, is it is it quotable? Are there lines from the movie that make their way into your everyday vernacular? Yeah. And I uh, by that measure, I think the clear winner is is Dave made a maze. I would say Dave, but I'm not sure because I did a podcast about that one. I'm more familiar with lines from it, so yeah. I don't know if I can objectively say. I mean, I don't. I can't think of any particular lines that stand out from Bigsby. I know. You know, where my beard at? Where's that beard at? Is, is now part of, and, and I mean, no <laughs> one around me knows what I'm talking about. No one says <laughs> my just beard on my face the way they're supposed to. Beard's on my face. I said, where's that beard at? I said the beard's on my face. What'd you say? I said the beard's on my face. But I say yeah. it, you know, that's kind of. And then, I mean, high five was a thing before Dave made a maze, but it'll never be the same. Yeah. It now belongs to that movie. Right. It, it, it was changed to that movie. We're cool. Here we are. High five. There's no high five from Brigsby Bear. Yeah. I mean, I think what, I think when we put it all together and bottom line it, I, I'm leaning towards Brigsby because, well, no one dies. There's, you don't have the deaths True. that you have. And I, well, I think it's a more optimistic movie. You don't have to, you don't have to destroy your creation in order to complete it or to complete yourself. Although, oh, go ahead. I would nitpick. You could finish the sentence first, but then I'll nitpick. Well, the next thing I was going to say is I, Greg James's father is initially not supportive, but it's just because it's, 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 you know, he doesn't understand what James needs and he's got yeah. some preconceived notions. He's got other things that they can do together other than making this film. I don't know. I just prefer that over Annie's frustration. And just comparing those characters in terms of the the close, the, you know, the family member who is frustrated with the the time that the creator is spending on the May slash film. I just, yeah. Greg seems a little bit more pure than Annie. And not that her frustration is not valid and that people get frustrated and, oh, no. you know, the way she is. But I just, yeah, and it, it, it's really close. So we have to get into, or I have to get into like these nitpicky little things to swing it one way or the other. My nitpick would be, I find it interesting that in the film of Brigsby Bear, the film within the film, mm-hmm. they do destroy everything. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, that's right. That's how Brigsby wins is by destroying the universe and rebirthing it, I, I, which is, I mean, there's a whole bunch of metaphors for what's going on in James's like mind and his, his had the film as therapy for him. But yeah, maybe it, it stands up better because the film that they make still exists. They don't destroy their product. And that's, and so that's I, I'm with you. Yeah. I but I, and I think that's something I need to watch. I think I've only seen Brigsby Bear three times. I had my initial watch. I did a rewatch and then specifically watched it recently preparing for this. Yeah. And the world of the television show that James then makes the movie of yeah. has you know, it has its own jargon. So there are characters mm-hmm. and spaceships and, and 
yeah. you know, solar systems and, and all have these strange names that I don't know yet. And maybe, you know, maybe when I learn those better, when I'll be able to follow the plot of the Brigsby movie a little bit better. And then maybe, the, you know, those lines become familiar and I start quoting them every day. <laughs> I know I, yeah, I think I, I, I need to watch it a little bit more to learn more about what's going on in Brigsby's world. But yeah, you're right. At the end, he ultimately has to sacrifice. Rather than have a universe where evil exists, he has to, uh, or he chooses to destroy the universe to get a new one, a new Big Bang, you know, a new universe of only good. So yeah, that's, yeah, you, uh, you, know, you put me in my place. <laughs> so they both, both, um, in both, destruction is part of creation. Now, as for my actual vote, this is my, my, technically the bracket was supposed to be my favorite films mm-hmm. or my top films. If I was picking for what's better for everyone else, I would say Brigsby Bear. I think it is more audience friendly because mm-hmm. it do- doesn't demand you go into the weirdness as much. I'm also tempted to pick it as my favorite if I had to pick one, but I don't want to pick one. I think I'm, I, I think I'm going to try to do that with all of these. Is this 36? It's like, fuck it. I have my favorite 36. I'm going to stick with it mm-hmm. because I don't need to pick my favorite one. I, I mean, I have a usual few that I will cite as my, if someone says like, what's your top five? I can name five that are probably my top five. Neither of these is in that top five, mm-hmm. but top 36 is great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Top 36. These are good films. Mm hmm. So I'm, I'm good with it and we'll keep, we'll keep both. <laughs> I'm not bracketing this down any further. This is just going to be discussions about movies. So one more time, Sean, where can they find, where can listeners find your shows? Um, yeah. So I did, uh, Spinal Tap Minute at spinaltapminute.com covering the film. This is Spinal Tap one minute at a time with a great co-host, Heidi Bennett. And I did Groundhog Minute covering the film Groundhog Day. One minute at a time, and that's at groundhog, uh, groundhogminute.com <laughs> with, uh, with our buddy Dave Palace. My current show is, uh, Next Scene Pod, uh, nextscenepod.com. It's, uh, the next scene where we cover pop culture one scene at a time. And my parent site that links to all those and links to all of my guest appearances, including this one, that's at catandshawn.org. At that site, you'll see, you know, the podcast I host the podcast where I've been a guest and that also has a list of flaming carrot comics of and which issues I have and which issues I need. So if you're interested in, in flaming <laughs> carrot comics and particularly what which comic books I've read and which ones I haven't, there's a list of those on that site as well. So uh, check that out. <laughs> I don't know why you would, but if you wanted to, yeah. it's there. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, and my website's in the outro. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having me. Thank you, listeners. Thank you for listening. We do this. Well, we do it for us, but it's it's nice for you yeah. to be here as well. It's it's therapy, and they just get to listen. Yeah. We hope it makes their brains better, too, mm-hmm. I guess. And if you haven't watched these films, both of them, they're very good. Brings oh, that's a giver. And, and Dave Mays and Mays. Dave Mays. They should have watched it before they listened to these. Oh, yeah. I should insert a warning before oh. uh, episode 20. I wouldn't say spoiler. I don't think we've, we maybe give away plot points, but I don't think we've spoiled anything. These are two perfectly good movies. They will stand up no matter what you've heard, you know, otherwise. Thank you for listening. This has been Cock and Bull Minute, a Tristram Shandy story. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Cock Bull Minute, or find us in the Facebook listeners group, Cock and Bull Pub. Find more content at lemmingdrops.com. I've kind of struggled with this, and I know Alan and I have talked about this several times. There are several high points in this movie, and one of them, of course, is the reanimation scene. Another one is this scene here where he really does embrace, I am Dr. Frankenstein. To you, which one is the more powerful scene, and which one is more the culmination of, or, you know, kind of the, the higher point of the movie? Thank you for asking. <laughs> this this is this is the moment. In in this minute and and in specifically it's about 33 seconds in 33 to 40 seconds is this is what the movie is about for me and this is what makes this I will put this up against anything. Any other movie this goes toe to toe. Um I mean I'm I, I I'm getting a little emotional just thinking about it and and speaking about it because 
what is what does this movie do that other movies do not do? What what makes it stand apart? And in terms of creation, now that's a very po- a powerful moment. I think another moment is when Frederick or Froderick is reading his grandfather's work, and he, you know, as as a rational man of science, he is once again yelling, "It could work." That's a very powerful moment. But but this. This is just amazing. This is astounding. And and one of the things, and, and you guys have talked about it, and, and I've talked about it, my, my previous guest spot, and I've talked about it on other podcasts, some of the, the themes of a monster movie and, and what, what makes a monster movie and what makes a monster movie is a great. And we get the man against science, this struggle of they, they thought so much about what they could do. They didn't think about what they should and the way that this creation, it, it backfired on the grandfather and it's causing some trouble. At least, you know, for now it looks like we're going to be okay, but we don't know. Can the doctor, can the scientist control his own creation? And that's something that we deal with in the real world. And we reference talked about with the creation of the atom bomb. And splitting the atom is, is a perfect example of something that as as humanity, as a species, we, we have this technological achievement, but it's it comes with dangers. It comes with side effects. And are we going to be able to control it? That's that's one theme of the monster movie. You've got the individual versus society. Later on, we'll see the townsfolk are not necessarily on board with what the good doctor is doing and they're not fans of this family of of the history so you've got the the scientist and his assistants versus the townsfolks and and the mob but what is encapsulated here and it's throughout the movie but but really this moment is the additional theme that i think is lacking from other horror and, and monster movies and that is the individual against his family that Froderick has been fighting his identity. And some of that is his ancestry and his family, and some of that is fighting himself. When he takes on that name, the the Frankenstein name, that acceptance of his grandfather and the acceptance of his family, that that is, it's a huge leap in the development of, of the character. And I think it touches on well, I think that this movie touches on there's there's three kinds of immortality or there's three ways you can be immortal that the film discusses. And the first is the obvious, the the engineering feat of reanimating dead tissue. That's that's one way you could become immortal. The second way is through your achievement, your name could live on if you make some great inven- invention or contribution to science or the arts. That's another way you can be immortal. And then the third way is through your name, through your family. If you have children, that you you pass on your genes and your name throughout time. And that's a, a type of immortality. And in the beginning, Froderick rejects all three. Well, in, in general, he rejects the idea of reanimating dead tissue. And for the next two, in terms of immortality through invention or through family, he is denying those to his grandfather. He's saying... This work is doo doo. There's nothing there worth remembering. And while he doesn't take the full step of legally changing his name, he changes the pronunciation enough to distance himself. And and I take I don't know. I know you talked about some of the stuff from the script and, and deleted scenes, but my impression just from watching the movie is the 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 will and, and everything from the grandfather is coming to him because he's the last descendant. He's the last of his generation. He's the only grandchild. So if he rejects his grandfather's name, then his grandfather is dead, that that name is going to die out. The family line ends and that type of immortality is denied to Victor. And so we've we've seen him come around. We've seen him. Well, first, he recognizes there's potential value in his grandfather's work with that scene that the it could work line. So that there's that possibility of immortality for his grandfather. Maybe the work lives on. And we see with the creation of the creature, he is able to reanimate life. So we see that form of immortality is possible. And then in this moment, he is granting 
his grandfather that final type of immortality that you could be remembered through your name, through your family and your descendants, that he is kind of claiming that as, yes, I am a Frankenstein. So he's making that connection to himself, who he is, to his family and his grandfather and just granting that type of immortality to be part of the family. And it's that aspect that that I think a lot of monster and horror movies are lacking. That aspect of family and being part of a chain of ancestry and descendants and, and that aspect of immortality in a name that gets passed on. And I think it's particularly touching because of what we know of Frederick that those practical types of immortality that I mentioned, the living on through your work or your creation and living on through your name – are things that he not only denies to his grandfather from in the beginning, they're things that he doesn't have in himself. We see him, uh, you know, he's supposed to be a man of some accomplishment, but where we, when we see him in the beginning, he is, he's speaking to students. He's instructing on what's known. It's not cutting edge stuff. He's not presenting to colleagues. This isn't new research. This isn't anything that's going to win awards. He's not breaking ground. He's not doing anything that's going to get him that kind of immortality through scientific achievement. And then the, the other thing, immortality through passing your genes on in your family name. Well, we, we've seen the relationship between Elizabeth and, and Froderick and the iciness, the frigidity there. And I'm not necessarily optimistic that that's going to warm up after marriage, that their married life is going to be any physically closer than their engagement has been. I mean, we, we haven't seen a lot of it, but we definitely saw enough to get an idea that they're not an affectionate couple, or maybe one side of the couple wants to be more affectionate, the other side, not so much. So you know, he doesn't have children, he doesn't have a family of his own, he doesn't have great achievement that's going to grant him immortality. Whereas now, now the puzzle's complete. He's got this creation, he's reanimated life, and he's accepted his place, he's accepted his name in the place of this family. I know you guys didn't necessarily bring me around for a lecture, but you got one anyway. But this is just this. This is why I love this movie. This is why I wanted to be a guest on the show. Why I love talking about this movie. Why I I want people to see this movie for this minute specifically, just those few seconds. That again, I will put this up against any scene in any movie, any time, any place in terms of power and emotion and the message of what the filmmakers are trying to say. It is just it's it's glorious. And it's, it's awe-inspiring. I'm awed that that much emotion, that much could be said in just the few seconds of the acceptance of the name, that simple line, my name is Frankenstein. It just, it's four words, but it says so much and conveys so much about the man and the monster and the science and, and everything just condensed, condensed into that moment. And uh, yeah, and I love it. All right, everybody, I know class is dismissed, <laughs> so you need to make sure you study up on Mary Shelley, on the biology of the brain, and be back ready for the quiz. Don't forget to turn in your homework by the end of the week. Oh, sorry, wait, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I really wish you had an opinion on that. Yeah, I was, I was yeah. wondering if you could flesh that out a little bit.